this video, we're going to identify wave-like properties of light, particle-like properties of light, and then we're going to explain a couple of really important experiments, the double split experiment, and then we're going to talk about the photoelectric effect as well. First, let's talk a little bit of history again. Throughout human history, there have been a lot of debates on the exact nature of what light is. As far back as 400 BC, people were debating about whether light was a wave or a particle. And as each step of history occurred and more and more scientific knowledge was developed, the debate continued on. So there's many more players in this game than just what's listed here. And the history of how each one came to decide what they thought um, is quite interesting, but we won't cover each one. We're going to move up to where we start talking about experiments that actually determine the wave and particle-like properties. Now, throughout all of this, once Einstein came along, he kind of solved the debate for what, at least for now, appears to be good. He said that it has both wave and particle-like properties, saying it's not one or the other, but rather both. We're going to talk about the two most famous experiments that establish that it has wave and particle-like properties. So first, we're going to look at Robert Hooke's experiment, which showed that light was a wave. Before watching this, it is extremely important that you understand wave interference. Make sure that you refer back to the earlier videos and podcasts and lectures on the topic of wave interference before continuing on to this one, or it won't really make a lot of sense at all. Now, I also want you to watch the Dr. Quantum video. They do a wonderful job of explaining this with animations um, that's a lot more engaging than watching a lecture on it. And then you can come back here for the kind of summary version. Now, here we have a diagram of what the other video, hopefully that you watched, the Dr. Quantum video, showed us. We can see that with a single slit, the light source above, that the waves are going to spread out. And then they have a second line where you have the double splits that the light can go through there as well. Now, as these waves go through the double split, they spread out and they interact with each other. They interfere with each other. Now, as they continue along the pathway, they eventually hit some sort of film or detector. And this film or detector picks up on the waves and either marks it with a light or in the case of your eyes on a wall, you can actually see this as well. The line across the top shows you what you would see if you were using visible light or a visible laser in a double split experiment. So this is actually two results stacked on top of each other because the distance of the splits cause a slightly different pattern. And so the top one has a slightly different distance between the splits than the bottom one. And those different distances cause the waves to interfere in a slightly different way. And that slight difference in interference causes the slight difference in the patterns that you see. Particles wouldn't do this. Particles go straight through a split and hit the wall. And so this shows that it has to have wave-like properties. Now, let's do a little quick example problem with this. It should be pretty simple if you've watched and understood the Dr. Quantum video, but I think it's useful to see the type of questions that I can ask on it. If you're still having a rough time, I would actually suggest going back to that video and rewatching it again. Now, take a minute and read the question, and then commit to an answer. Write it down before pressing play. Now, here we're asking what happens if you send an electron one at a time through the double splits. So I give you three options. I say that it goes through one or the other, and it behaves like a particle, and you just get a line through one or the other. I also say that it picks one, and even if you send one electron and you wait a few seconds and you send another and you wait a few seconds and you send another, the electron's always going to pick the same split, and you just get one line behind it. And then I also gave you the option of you have the electron, even though you send it one at a time, you still get an interference pattern. So hopefully you picked that you still get the interference pattern. And this might seem a little strange because if you're sending one electron through at a time, you wouldn't think that it could interfere with itself. And yet it does. And this has to do with the fact that it behaves like a wave. Because even if you're only sending one electron through, that electron is going to effectively go through both slits and then interact with itself. And there's different explanations for how this could work. Um, and we're still looking into this and there's still scientists doing research on this even today. But that's what happens. Now, what Young's initial experiment doesn't show us is the idea that it also has particle-like properties. There have since been um, expansions on Young's experiment that do show us the particle-like properties, but we're not going to go into that too much. Now, because of the structure of the experiment that Einstein did, 
we are able to see these properties. Because of the structure that Young did, we could not see the properties. So this doesn't mean that Young was wrong. It doesn't mean that his experiment was invalid. It just means that it was only testing for wave-like properties, so we only saw wave-like properties. Einstein devised an experiment that showed that light has both wave and particle-like properties in one experiment, though. And this was called wave-particle duality. Now, the photoelectric effect is actually what Einstein won his Nobel Prize for. Since he's so well known for his theory of relativity, often people will think that that was what his Nobel Prize was for. However, it was actually for the photoelectric effect. Um, there's actually a lot of interesting controversy about this, um, and if you ever want to kind of go deep diving into the internet on some history of science, this is an interesting area to do it. Now, what is the photoelectric effect that Einstein came up with? When we shine light onto a metal surface, if that light is of sufficient energy, an electron will be ejected from this metal surface. However, this will require that the incoming light has enough energy to eject the electron. And furthermore, it has to be the energy of one photon. You cannot combine multiple photons in order to eject the electron. Now, if the energy of each individual photon can, is of high enough energy to eject an electron, an electron will be ejected. We'll look at an example to illustrate this. So if we have violet light, we can quite possibly, depending on the metal, be able to eject an electron off potassium. If we were to do this with red light, even if we shine the brightest red light in the entire world on this piece of metal, it would not eject an electron. Now, keep in mind as we're discussing the experiment, the difference between energy and intensity. When we are talking about energy, we are talking about the energy of the photon. Unless we say something that implies we're not, like total energy, or the energy of many photons, or the energy of a mole of photons. But if we just say energy, we're talking about that of one photon. But we can also increase or decrease the intensity as well. If we think about what intense light is, what we mean is a bright light. In scientific terms, that means that it's a light with a lot of photons being emitted. If it's in the visible region, we can think of intensity and brightness um, being related. And then we can also remember that energy is related to frequency, if that helps to remind us that we're talking about the energy of a photon. Because if you have many, many photons, each photon is going to have a frequency, and you aren't going to add up those frequencies. We can also think of that as being the color of light if we're talking about the visible region. So energy, frequency, and wavelength, if we're in the visible region, show up as colors to us. Now, for each photon, we can only get one ejected electron. So one photon is not able to eject two electrons, no matter how high the frequency. So if you put in 100 photons, at most you can get 100 electrons. And that's a really important concept for a lot of problem solving that you're going to be doing too. So make sure that not only do you know that one photon equals one electron, but make sure that you know that you know it so that you can use it in problem solving. Now let's talk about some problem solving. How can we figure out what energy needs to be used in order to eject the electrons? Each metal is going to have a specific work function, or the amount of energy that it takes to eject the electrons. And this tells you the energy that you need. If you know the work function, you know the threshold energy. To find the threshold frequency, you use E equals H nu, which is the same equation that we've talked about in earlier podcasts. Now, I want you to do a little activity before we go too much further into this. And it's going to help you visualize a lot of what I said in the last slide, because that can sound a little bit like gibberish. But if you can play with the experiment itself, it can help you understand it. And it, this will help you understand the math that we're doing a lot, too. Um, even if it seems a little simple, I highly recommend that you go do it. It will save you a lot of points on an exam and a lot of time when it comes to studying. So first you're going to go to this, and on the next slide you're going to pause it and spend some time playing with each of these on your own. Familiar set, familiarize yourself with the system, with each of the buttons, with each of the, the little gauges that you can move around, and learn some of the things through exploration. Now, once you come back, We'll go to the next slide, and then I'll ask you some specific questions. Then use the system to solve for those specific questions and answer those. And then we'll try to answer some questions without using the model. Hopefully you spent some time playing with the, playing with the system by itself. Now I want you to answer some questions. <laughs> 
So use the simulation to do this. Um, it's a little bit better at sticking in your memory if you actually play with the buttons as opposed to just trying to answer the questions. Answer them for yourself by exploring the simulation. Now, you can get the list from the PowerPoint document online as well um, if you don't want to pause the video and flip back and forth, so that's fine. But regardless of what you do, take some time and do it. I'm going to post a separate video of a screen share of me working through this on myself um, rather than posting it in here. And so if you do really need to go get that help on your own or need to get some help and you can't do it on your own, you can see that video. Now, let's do some individual examples without using the simulation. But these examples aren't going to make a lot of sense if you haven't taken the time to look at the simulation. So please do that. Now, let's look at one of the questions again, and we're not going to use the simulation to help this time. What happens if the intensity of light is increased? So let's remember what intensity translate to in words that we're kind of used to and how we perceive it. We perceive intensity as brightness because it's a greater number of photons. So when you hear intensity, think greater number of photons and think brighter. Now, in order to get it brighter or more intense, we're going to increase the number of photons, which I just said, but we want to drive that point home. If you have more photons, remember that our rule is one photon for one electron and no more. So the more photons you have, the more electrons you're going to have. Now, there is an important caveat here. I didn't say anything about the frequency. So we do need to make a note of whether we're above or below the threshold frequency. If you are below the threshold frequency in a photoelectric effect, you are never going to get a photon ejected. Now, if you are at the threshold frequency or above it, the more you increase the intensity, the more photons that are going to come off. And so this is sort of a two-part question. Below the frequency, nothing's going to happen. Above the threshold frequency, you'll get more and more photons as you increase the intensity. So let's look at another one of these questions without the simulation to help. What if the intensity of light is kept the same, but the frequency is increased? In this case, because intensity is going to be kept the same, we are inputting the same number of photons. It's just that each photon has a higher energy, or if you want to think of it like this, a higher frequency. This higher energy is going to be transferred to the electron in the form of kinetic energy or velocity, if you would prefer to think of it in terms of the speed. So if we are already above the threshold frequency and we're already ejecting electrons, those electrons are now going to be ejected at a higher velocity or kinetic energy. Notice I didn't say rate because that would almost imply maybe what we were talking about on the last slide. So try to be clear with your language and say a higher kinetic energy or velocity. Now, if we're below the threshold, initially nothing's going to happen. As you increase and increase and increase the frequency, eventually you'll hit the threshold and electrons will start to be ejected. And then if you keep increasing, it will again increase the kinetic energy or the velocity. This is the main ideas behind the photoelectric effect and the main concepts. I want to add on um, one little thing that we can do um, that's really helpful with this. We can actually make a very easy to read graph out of the photoelectric effect as well. And from this, we can get an equation that we're going to solve a lot of our photoelectric effect problems with. And I think that if you can see the graph, it will make actually turning this into um, the mathematics a little bit easier. So let's look at this equation. I have energy and I have a little k underneath and that's to show us that it's the kinetic energy of the electrons. So we want to be really clear in this chapter about which energies we're talking about. So we have the kinetic energy is equal to h nu. Now we know that h nu is also the energy of light. So the kinetic energy is equal to the energy of light minus phi. And I haven't introduced phi yet, but phi in the work function and w are all used interchangeably for this. So if we think about what this equation says, it says that the kinetic energy of the ejected electrons is the energy of the light that we initially put in minus the energy that it takes to eject it from the metal. And that makes a lot of sense. If we were to think about it a slightly different way, it would be that the energy of the electron and the energy, of the ener the energy that it took to remove the electron is equal to the energy that we put in. So it's kind of just a restatement of the conservation of energy. Okay, so now if we look at this equation and just put it in terms of variables, 
if we were to put y, if we were to put the kinetic energy on our y-axis, and we were to put the frequency of light on our x-axis, we would have a linear graph. We'd have y equals mx plus b, where m, or the slope, is equal to h, and the intercept, or the b, is equal to the work function. Now we can't have a negative for this particular thing, and so that's why you see here at the bottom it just goes to zero. But you can also see what would happen if you extend it out on the little inset in the graph, and that it would eventually cross at negative work function. So before the threshold frequency, no kinetic energy is present. That's why we have the line at zero. After the threshold frequency, the relationship is linear. Now let's do an example problem using this equation that we have and using all the concepts we know about energy, wavelength, and frequency. Take a second and read the problem. And we're going to make a plan. So here I give you the work function for calcium. And I ask you what the minimum frequency of light required to eject the electrons is. So in other words, I'm asking you for the threshold frequency. For this, we're going to need to use the equation from the previous slide. Now, this is going to be a two-step problem. So first, we're going to find the threshold frequency. That's the first part. And then we're going to find the kinetic energy and the velocity at a different frequency of light. So we're going to use what we find in A to solve for part B. And this is a very stereotypical problem for this chapter, so please make sure that you can replicate this idea on your own. So first, let's lay out a plan and work on our problem-solving skills. For part one, we have an equation that relates the work function to the kinetic energy. Notice here that I switched the notations. So I've been trying to switch back and forth between work and phi because different sources are going to give you different symbols and you should know both. Now we can use this to give us the minimum frequency of light that will eject from calcium. For the second part, we want to know the kinetic energy of the ejected electron. And we know our frequency. And we'll be able to plug that in once we get it from part A. So now that we have a plan, let's work through this with numbers. We must first find the threshold frequency. This is when the electron will be knocked loose, but no kinetic energy will be transferred. Since the kinetic energy equals 0, we can rearrange our equation so that h nu is equal to the work function. Once we get that, we can solve for frequency. And this is going to give us our minimum frequency of light that will eject an electron from calcium. This step where we set kinetic energy to zero is very, very important that you recognize. This is something that you must remember and you must remember it well enough to be able to use it, or you must know that you know it, so that you can use it whenever you're solving these sorts of problems. So remember whenever you're at the threshold frequency or the threshold energy, that you can say that the kinetic energy of the electrons are going to be zero and use this step. So try to learn this concept rather than just memorizing it, because if you memorize it, you're more likely to forget it, and you're less likely to be able to pull it into your problem solving. So what I mean by that is understand that the reason that the kinetic energy and the velocity are zero at the threshold frequency is because the incident light, or the light that we're shining, only has enough energy to knock the electron free, but it doesn't have any excess energy that can give it extra velocity. So now that we have this, we can move on to the second part. We want to know the kinetic energy of the ejected electron at this new velocity, or this new frequency. So we solve for E by filling in our frequency that was given and our work function. Once we know the kinetic energy, we can fill into 1 half mv squared to solve for the velocity. To do this, we'll have to fill in our mass. But that mass is known because it's for an electron. So remember when we're talking about kinetic energy, that we're talking about the mass of an electron. And so that is a known value. And when you're taking an exam, it'll be on the exam. From here, all we have to do is calculate our value. And we get our velocity. We'll check our units. And we'll check our significant figures. 
and everything looks okay. So let's summarize what we've learned today. We started out by talking about a large amount of controversy through history about what light really was. We discussed two experiments that showed that wave particle duality of light. And something that I'd like to just add to this that we're going to talk about more later is that this is also true of very small matter. So it's true of both light and small matter. And we'll talk about all of that in the future podcasts. We talked about the double split experiment, which showed just the wave-like pro properties of light at the time that it was done. And then we showed the photoelectric effect and how it showed us both the wave particle duality of light. And then we did several calculations and we drew some graphs and all of that you need to make sure that you know for the exams as well by doing lots and lots of practice problems.